The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hi, and welcome back to The Learning Circuit. If you've been following along, we've been learning about electricity, magnetism, and how they work together in inductor coils. Well, today we're going to continue on that journey and learn about motors. But sorry, Marvel fans, today we're going to be sticking to DC. In previous episodes, we learned how an electric current passing through a coil generates a magnetic field. We also know that with magnets, like poles repel while unlike poles attract. These forces can be used together to turn electrical energy into mechanical energy by making a motor. So let's make one and see how that works. Here I have a coil made of magnet wire, the same we use to make our electromagnet. Now the enamel has been scraped off parts of the ends so that we can connect it in a circuit. If I connect the ends of the coil to a battery, an electric current will flow through the coil creating a magnetic field with a north pole on one side of the opening and a south pole on the other. Now if I add a magnet and connect the coil so that it spins freely, the two magnetic fields interact and the coil spins continuously. This is a very simple DC or direct current motor. There's a visual mnemonic device often used called Fleming's left hand rule. It shows the correlation between the direction of the current, the direction of the magnetic flux, and the direction of rotation or thrust. Let's do that with our motor. Direct current flows from negative to positive. The force from the magnet is going up. The coil spins towards the magnet. If I try to make the coil spin the other way, it won't. It'll stop and reverse itself. Personally, I still find the rule a little confusing, but I wanted to mention it anyway in case it's helpful. Every DC motor has two parts that generate magnetic fields. Those fields interact and the motor spins. Now one part is always a coil or winding. The second part can be either a permanent magnet or a second electromagnet referred to as the field coil or field winding. Let's take a look at some manufactured motors and see. Here I have motors from a computer disk drive and a computer fan. I've removed part of the casing so that we can see inside. These motors have permanent magnets as the second part that generates a magnetic field. The armature, this center part here, is made of windings wrapped around a toothed piece of metal called a lamination. Laminate means it's made of layers. If you look closely at the end of the tooth, you can see them. Depending on the purpose of the motor, the shaft may be directly connected to the inner portion, like with the disc motor, or the shaft can be connected to the outer portion, like with the fan. The portion that moves or rotates is called the rotor. The inner armature on the disc motor and the permanent magnet on the fan. These are the rotors. On the fan, the armature is connected to the shaft with a bearing that allows it to spin freely. The part that remains stationary is called the stator. The metal tooth lamination is often referred to as a stator, but really it can be either the stator or the rotor. It all just depends on the style of the motor. Manufactured motors are designed to be more efficient than our little motor here. You may have noticed they have multiple windings, three here and four here, as opposed to the one on our little motor. The coil in our motor has one north and one south pole, which are repelled or attracted by the one magnet. The polarity of the coil is determined by the direction the current is flowing. If we reverse the polarity of the coil by either flipping the power source or coiling in the other direction, the poles also flip. If we take a rotor lamination with three teeth, and alternate the direction the coil is wound, then the teeth will have alternating polarity. By adding magnets with alternating polarity to the stator, we now have multiple points of force that are attracting and repelling, causing the motor to spin. But motors are still even more efficient than that. If the coils always had the same polarity, they could just stay attracted to one of the magnets and stop spinning altogether. So instead, motors are designed for the current in the coils to alternate, flipping the poles when it's advantageous. The first design of this was a brushed motor using a commutator as a switch. Around the motor shaft is a conductive ring, the commutator. You can see that it's broken into segments. Each segment is connected to a winding. Current is transferred from the power source to the commutator through stationary brushes. The brushes are made of a soft conductive material that presses against the commutator. As the rotor turns, when the different teeth of the commutator touch the brushes, the direction of current and therefore the polarity in that coil is changed. As the polarity in the coils change, the unlike charges attract to the permanent magnets while the like charges repel, which results in continuous rotation of the motor. 
Brushed motors requiring physical contact between the brushes and the commutator can have problems. That physical contact wears out the brushes as well as adds increased friction, making the motor less efficient. But along with the discovery of semiconductors and the invention of solid state electronics came the development of brushless motors. Rather than relying on the mechanical interaction between the commutator and brushes, brushless motors use sensors and electronics to determine the orientation of the rotor and to switch the direction of current running through each coil. Today, brush motors are being phased out of most applications and replaced with brushless or AC motors, but they can still be useful. Let's look at some pros and cons of both types of motors. Brushed motors benefit from their lack of electronics. They are cheaper and simpler to build and control. They can be used in certain extreme environments since there is no concern for any electronics to malfunction. And despite the brushes wearing out, the brushes can be replaced to extend the life of the motor. However, the wear on the brushes and commutator means that they periodically require maintenance. The friction also reduces torque at higher speeds and overall results in a lower speed range. There is sparking at the commutator contacts that can be a fire hazard, as well as generating electric noise or electromagnetic interference that affects nearby microelectronics. The friction and arcing also produces heat that requires cooling. Brushless motors have the benefit of not having brushes. This allows for less maintenance, higher speeds, and more torque, and therefore are more efficient, and have a higher output power for their size. The reduced size and less friction allows for more efficient heat dissipation and less electronic noise. But brushless motors still aren't perfect. With the lack of brushes, the overall construction is more expensive, the controls are more complex, and can be more expensive than the rest of the motor itself. So basically, brushed motors are good for use in certain environments and if you need a less expensive solution, but in general, brushless motors are better. Before we finish for the day, I want to talk about a couple other types of hobby motors, steppers and servos. Both steppers and servos are used when precise position is desired. Steppers have up to 100 poles that allow them to rotate to a set degree. Servos can also rotate to precise positions, but must be coupled with an encoder to do so. Steppers and servos each have their advantages. Steppers function very well at lower speeds, while servos are more suited for higher speeds. At startup, steppers do not inherently know where they are and must move to a known position or until activating a limit switch. Servos, coupled with an encoder, know their position on startup. While the encoder provides a higher performance, it also makes servos more expensive to use. While both are often found in CNC and precision machinery, servos are also often found in remote control or radio controlled devices. Thanks for joining me today to talk about motors. If you have any additional information you'd like to add to help others learn more, please post that on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. Happy learning!